Say you are somebody that needs a machine with PCIe expandability that runs macOS, but you can't afford a 2019 Mac Pro. You hop on Facebook Marketplace and grab one of the cheapest 8-core models you can. When you get home and plug it in, to your dismay, you find out it's a 2008 Mac Pro. Yet, you wonder if it'll still work just as good as the 2009 or 2010 Mac Pros. Today, I am here to answer that question. If you ended up with a 2008 Mac Pro, is it even any good today? To see if this version of the Mac Pro is still any good, I will be benchmarking both games and productivity software on this system. Yes, that even includes my suffering in VR, so y'all better hit that like and subscribe buttons to help ease my suffering. To make this a fair benchmark, I will of course be switching solely to this Mac Pro with my 1080 Ti slept inside to give it as good of a chance as possible to impress me. Starting off with a bit of history, the Mac Pro lineup was released mainly for folks in the professional crowd that needed PCI Express expansion capabilities as well as a crapload of RAM and processing power in a single Apple machine that was Intel based. This version of the Mac Pro specifically was a more refined version of the previous 8 core configuration of the 2007 Mac Pro and made those 8 cores quite a bit more affordable, around $2,000 cheaper, and quite a bit less power hungry. Specifically, this is the 2.8 GHz 8 core configuration, which houses two Xeon E5462s. The E5462 is part of the Harpertown architecture, so it has four cores and four threads that run at 2.8 GHz with, because it's a Core 2 Quad, 2 by 6 megabytes of level 2 cache, a 16 megahertz front side bus frequency, and a pretty decent 80 watt TDP. Essentially, it's the Xeon version of the Core 2 Quad Q9550. This machine also happens to have 8 2 gigabyte DIMMs of ECC fully buffered DDR2 and the GT120 a Mac-only OEM card. Before heading on to the benchmarks, I want to show you some really interesting aspects about the design of this Mac Pro, but if you don't care about that, you can skip directly to the start of the benchmarks at the timestamp on screen now. Given that this is a classic Mac Pro, it uses the original cheese grater design that lasted from the Power Mac G5 to the 2010 Mac Pro. So, to your random fellow, it can be quite hard to see the slight differences between each Mac Pro and the Power Mac G5 to see how good of a purchase you're about to make. I really do love the design of these machines. It's still quite modern looking, but this one internally lacks some of the polish you'd see on the next gen Mac Pros or something as old as like the Power Mac G5. The CPUs are actually on the motherboard this time, but the RAM is actually on not just one, but two daughter cards. You still get the same PCI Express slots in the same number of lanes at the same speed as the later Mac Pros though. Now, the best way to tell the difference between these machines is what I.O. they have on the front, and if they have one or two DPD drive slots on the front of the machine. If you only have one slot, you have a Power Mac G5. If you have two, then you have an Intel Mac Pro. On top of that, if your front I.O. looks like this, it's a Mac Pro 2006, 7, or 2008 model. And if your front I.O. looks like this, then you have the 2009 or 2010 Mac Pro. Easy once you know what to look for, but rather annoying nonetheless. 
That's enough time looking at just the tower itself. How about we take a look at what it can do in gaming? Yes, folks, we are going to be playing or trying to play as many games as I possibly can on a computer that is now nearly 15 years old and trying to see whether or not it can still run games decently quickly. The GPU we'll be using today for the benchmarks is my hybrid GTX 1080 Ti. As these CPUs, or the X5550s and the 2009 Mac Pro, will not be able to fully utilize it. To show the difference in performance, I will be including the previous results from my other Mac Pro in purple when it had the X5550s. But, because Avorian, Crossout, and BeamNG had performance updates, their results are not going to be included. And just before we get into the benchmarks, I should also note that while the resolution and graphics settings will be very high, going lower made no difference to the frame rate due to the aforementioned lack of utilization. So now's the time to see how it does. Which means we got VR games up first. Oh boy. Right off the bat, we got Vivecraft, which didn't run too well with 32 FPS on average. It had some extreme stuttering when you generated new chunks, but it was mostly playable as long as you didn't move around too quickly. Elite Dangerous was completely unplayable though, with a whopping average of 24 FPS and those horrendous lows. It genuinely started making me sick even though I am quite resistant to motion sickness. Bone Lab was just about playable, thankfully, but it suffered with some pretty bad stutters, netting an average of 40 FPS, but it would quickly drop into the 20 FPS region when loading a new area or dropping into the tack pit, which is a very bad time to stutter. Dirt Rally 2.0 VR ran surprisingly well, given the low frame rate. I got 30 FPS as the average, but it felt far smoother than that. Very similar to the kind of 30 FPS you'd see on a console. Extremely consistent. Lastly, we got VR Chat, which ran a little worse than it does on the Quest 2. Standalone. With 28 FPS on average, with terrible lows going down to 12 FPS relatively often, it would be better just to play it standalone on the Quest. With the VR games benchmarked, we can move on to the flat panel games. First up with those games is Crossout, which had a nice 79 FPS average, but it felt really stuttery to me. Now, I didn't have FreeSync because I'm using HDMI, but still. BeamNG Drive did run better than my Q6600 could manage, with an average of 32 FPS, but don't dare think about spawning in traffic cars, or else that average will drop fast. Rocket League is the first flat panel game I played that was actually properly smooth, with the average frame rate being a nice 84. Heck, I was even able to score some goals. No Man's Sky, however, was not able to run very well, with 35 FPS on average, but very bad lows, giving 13 FPS. And did I mention the stutters when it came to loading lots of objects? Yeah. Avorian also did not run very well at all with my late game test, yielding an average of 22 FPS and the worst lows yet of 6. But this was significantly better than my Q6600. Cyberpunk 2077? Dumb. Yeah, that that's right, it flatlined. The reason for which is that the E5462 lacks AVX instructions and SSE 4.2. You can use a mod to bypass this requirement, but the frame rate would be so awful, I didn't bother trying. Shadow of the Tomb Raider did run, er, 
well jogged, with 33 FPS being the average, with pretty bad 5% lows of 23 FPS. Doom Eternal also doomfed. All it would do was, after clicking on the play button in Steam, it would, after about 30 seconds, kill itself. No windows showed up or anything. So I'm pinning this on lack of instruction. Last on the list for gaming is the Halo Master Chief Collection, which actually did run pretty all right with 44 FPS on average, but the lows could get a little nasty with 20 FPS being the 1% low. Is everyone liking the fact that I am benchmarking more games than I used to? It's actually a bit more fun for me to do this now benchmarking this many games. But now, how did these Core 2 adjacent chips hold up against their successor? The X5550. Well, far better than I was expecting. With the games that I did test back then that are comparable, some games really ran worse on this system than they did with the X5550s. But... Then there were some games that managed to match or get very close to the same performance. Those being Vivecraft and VR Chat, albeit with worse lows. As you can see, while it ran most of the games that I benchmarked, it couldn't run all of them. And the ones it did run didn't run all that well. This is why you need to be vigilant on the version of Mac Pro that you're going to be buying. I'd say that just about does it for gaming, but this is a professional machine. So how about we go ahead and run some professional software? Yep, to compare again to the X5550s, I am going to be running the exact same suite of programs and tests as I did when I benchmarked the X5550s to show how much better they are versus these E5462s. On screen now, you see the previous results with the X5550s. So, wasting no more time, let's see what these E5462s end up scoring. First, with the Blender Open Benchmark, these CPUs scored 29.32 points. To put that into perspective, these two 80-watt CPUs scored 5 points worse than a 25 watt mobile i5-8250U. That ain't good. Running the CPU profile benchmark now, this machine scored 1,481 points for all threads and 217 points for a single thread. Lastly is Cinebench and the score there is 2,756 for multi-core and 410 for single core. So after doing the testing, it is apparent that this thing is quite bad in comparison to the X5550s, but not in all tests. The E5462 gets absolutely thrashed in multi-core due to lacking multi-threading, but the single core score in 3D Mark is somehow better than the X5550? And then Cinebench is quite close to the X5550, which I was not expecting. Clearly, due to how the Core 2 architecture works, as long as your program doesn't need more than two threads, this machine is actually somehow still half decent. But this is 2023, and programs easily take four, six, or eight threads, so that's not something that you'll be in for a good time with. The reason being that this machine is essentially a quad socket dual core machine. At least it communicates as such. That means that the latency for anything that spans more than two cores is insane, which is why the multi-core scores aren't too hot. Moving on to video editing, trying to edit this video, and, well, it's a nightmare. Because I now render videos at 1440p, even dealing with a 4K60 video strip 
is just absolute torture. And don't even get me started on trying to do the bar graph section of the video. And lastly, for productivity stuff, I do actually need to talk about web browsing performance and stuff like that. This is actually old enough of a machine now that while web pages load fine and don't have any issues, they don't load super quickly. Before I had my 1080 Ti's driver installed, I could just about watch 720p YouTube. So yeah, I'd say that the E5462 and any Core 2 series of CPUs at this point is definitely obsolete. Programs on the web are leaving it behind, and you should too, at least as your daily computer. Finally, with all my benchmarking done, I've got a few things to say about this thing before ending the video. Now, I know that some of you are certainly confused as to the reason why I didn't try overclocking these CPUs via set FSB, which is something you can totally do, by the way, for benchmarking today. The reason why is that for some reason the Mac Pro ties the system clock to the front side bus speed, meaning that anything that relies on the system clock to be at the same speed and not run too fast, well, run too fast. A nice example of this is that audio was clipping and sped up when it was sent to my VR headset with virtual desktop when I had it overclocked from 2.8 to 3.2 gigahertz. Now, I don't recommend buying this machine. Mainly down to the poor performance and lack of instructions, which are actually starting to matter these days. Oh, and one more thing. The reason why I didn't set the power limit of my 1080 Ti lower is because I didn't need to. These CPUs could not push the 1080 Ti to draw more than 225 watts the entire time, so OCP never got tripped, and it never got hotter than 52 degrees Celsius. Well, that's it. I know this was a bit of a longer video today, but if you wonderful people enjoyed today's video, make sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons as well as that bell so you never miss another upload from me. As always, I have a Patreon where you can help me out so I can keep making videos well into the future. Anyways, DDT out.